Well, we're pretty stable at 25 now. Perhaps I can start and we'll kick it off. Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, welcome to ESIP session on advances in semantic harmonization from the cryosphere to the earth system. I'm Gary Burkfrost. And before we start and get into the substance of the session, just a reminder about session mechanics, starting with the Pico chat and Zoom with people are on here. Uh, we are room three and we're sharing our screen with our master document, which includes an outline, information on presenters, uh, an outline of the session and uh, links to documents that you will need. There it is, uh, good job. Uh, this is the master document I was talking about. Um, we will put a link into the master document in the Zoom chat. Um, and there are notes uh, that you can use at the bottom of the page. Uh, also, of course, we have chat. Uh, if you're having problems with anything, uh, you can ping us in, in the chat and we'll try to respond. Uh, so as we start, it's important to note that we abide by ESIP community participation standards that aims at supporting a professional community where all people are safe to participate and use ideas and not be discriminated against for any background. And we expect respect. I think we've been having a good good session, so that's, uh, that's good, good to uh, continue on. Um, we also ask on the master document you, um, again, you're seeing, uh, sign in for the attendance record. We've listed our participants there at, at the beginning and we invite note taking as you say. Okay, with that basics, uh, let's get on to the substance and we can go to the first slide or two, introductory slides. Um, we can make that a full view. Uh, again, I'm back, Gary Berg for us. I'm a co-chair of the Semantic uh, Harmonization Cluster along with Ruth Dewar, who is also listed in participants and on the agenda. If you go to slide two, you'll see the list of, of presenters that we have uh, in sequence uh, after me from Ruth down to Kai. And slide three presents an outline of our agenda, time uh, areas. The logic of that is that we're going to talk uh, some from the basics on to uh, more advanced topics, uh, ending with uh, a discussion of tools to help you with all the above. Uh, and then we're going to follow that on with uh, reports and discussions of different clusters and uh, then more a more general discussion. Um, some history of the uh, cluster. The cluster, Semantic Conversation Cluster, is a spin-off of the uh, Semantic Technologies Committee it has a long-term objective to disseminate uh, best practices for harmonizing a range of available semantic resources, all in support of enhancing things that we're interested in, like data documentation, discoverability of data, access to data, and the very big challenge of interoperability. Our near-term focus under the auspices of the World Meteorological Organization's Global Cryosphere Watch program, quite a mouthful, has been harmonizing the cryosphere area, which can as things like ice and glaciers and such, and bringing ENVO and suite ontologies up to date with that domain uh, vocabulary. Much of the cluster's work takes place on the second and third Wednesday of the month during a one or a two hour uh, mini hackathon sessions. You're invited to participate if that okay. proves interesting. A few words about the goals of the session. Broadly, we are reporting on significant work reflected in the outline, uh, progress we think uh, will be of use to some, some of the, uh, the attendees. We will also be illustrating what we think are uh, can be adopted more broadly in ESIP as methods. We also want to discuss useful principles uh, with those methods that can help with semantic efforts, along with tools, as you see on the agenda on uh, slide three and on the master page. Uh, finally, on the agenda, we want to hear from uh, related uh, ESIP groups on their semantic harmonization status and discuss next steps that we might take jointly. So I'll conclude with uh, slide, the next slide, I think that's slide four, with a few words on semantic harmonization. Um, as you see in the diagram, those are, or the, uh, the picture, those are fighting words, mister, unless, of course, you're ju them just semantics. Well, so I'm imagining this as two, uh, uh, Earth science, uh, uh, Earth scientists discussing this at happy hour, and they're discussing the lithosphere. And different people might have different takes on that. Uh, they might have ideas about um, the a surface concept, or maybe the lithosphere being part of a, of a planetary cluster. Harmonization of terms meaning starts with human conversations, often around definitions and concepts, and, and attempts to reach agreement, which you'll hear more about. 
But importantly, now we want to represent these grand uh, uh, ideas and things agreed upon in a semantic language. A harmonized digital version will include, for example, axioms expressing part and superclass relations. So as you go through the talks, you'll hear what we think are some advice from lessons learned and principles as to what goes into finding a good definition, how to assess the semantic quality of a definition, how to make definitions reusable and represented as part of an ontology. Also, what goes in aligning terms and ont uh, on ontological entries is an important topic. All of this we'll try to cover. And with that, let me turn it over with the next slide to Ruth, who will guide us through harmonizations from the bottom up, lessons from her, her harmonization efforts on various cryosphere vocabularies. I should add that we'll let uh, the speakers, the presenters decide if they have time for questions at the end, although we have time at the very end for more uh, discussion, okay? All right, thank you, Gary. Um, but first, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I'm connecting from uh, native lands uh, that in, uh, in my case are the Ute, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Osheti Shakoween are the four major groups of indigenous people from uh, where I'm at. Um, but I'd like to start off just reminding everybody uh, about the um, semantic ladder or spectrum um, and how things like controlled vocabularies and glossary and thesauri are indeed semantic resources. But down at that low end, everything is pretty much just strings. So while they're helpful for humans to understand what's going on, they're not so helpful for machines. Uh, in other words, you can't reason over them. Whereas at the top of the uh, spectrum, upper right, um, we have ontologies, which encapsulate a lot of machine understandable, readable knowledge. And the reason why I'm talking about that is because all of these different kinds of resources are useful and necessary because ideally systems need to work for people and end machines as well. So next slide, please. Okay, so a couple of years ago, I actually was funded by the Cryos Global Cryosphere Watch to um, take a look at the 27 unique uh, glossaries of cryospheric terms. These had been developed from different subcommunities uh, within the cryosphere. So, you know, so there's snow glossaries and glacier related terms and sea ice related terms, etc. And you notice there's about 4,100 entries from those 27 glossaries, but only about half of those are unique. In other words, Many terms or even most terms have multiple definitions. Next slide, please. And this is a graphic illustration of the issue. Um, this is one page of about three pages. There are a total of 14 different definitions for the term ablation. And I'd like to call out some points about a few of these definitions. The first definition talks about ice and snow and a process of melting and evaporation. Whereas the second one actually adds a more specificity to where these things happen. So it's talking about surfaces of glaciers or snow fields. And also that it's talking about a quantity, not a process so much, um, at least in the second half. And, and the reduction of uh, snow water equivalent by melting evaporation, and they add wind and avalanches. And the third definition says any process that reduces the mass of a glacier, not just the ones mentioned above. And so they include, again, an, another term, calving. Um, and they also note that sublimation loss of windborne snow and avalanching are significant processes often, and that often ablation is used as a synonym for surface ablation, though there are other kinds of ablation, internal, basal, and frontal. 
And then skipping down to the bottom, we have a note which kind of explains a little bit of the differences between all of these definitions that prior to 1980, ablation did not include mechanical removal of either snow or ice. In other words, prior to 1980, typically if a publication is talking about ablation, they're not including wind erosion, avalanches or cabling. So next slide, please. So just, just in summary, um, prior to 1980, mechanical processes weren't included. Ablation, the term is used as a process, a region, and an amount of mass removed. It's often used as a synonym of surface ablation, and there are other kinds of ablation. Um, some of the definitions only talked about snow and ice, others included water in any form, and a variety of other restrictions on what it applies to. Um, and some of the definitions, not so much the ones that I showed, but some of the other ones included uh, additional discussion of the physics involved, which would be useful for connecting uh, the cryospheric ontology to other ontologies, noting that ablation is actually, you know, not a term that's restricted to um, the cryosphere, because, for example, you can you can uh, have a, a ablation process in, in an operating theater, you know, doing um, ablation for um, heart problems, etc. So, next slide. So, I'd like you all to think about that for a little bit, and imagine what would happen if every community created their semantic resources using only one of those source glossaries, the one most relevant to them. Just think about that for a minute. Next slide. And then imagine a later what would happen when those disparate communities decided that they actually now need to reuse each other's data and systems that that used those disparate resources, semantic resources they just created. What do you get? And the answer is, next slide, the Tower of Babel. In other words, you would have, if you tried to reason across those ontologies, you would be trying to reason across things that consider ablation to be a process, things that consider it to be a region, things that consider it to be, you know, an amount. In other words, it would be a mess. So next slide. And so I guess what I'm saying is that um, you, you need to actually think about harmonizing um, across every single level of the semantic ladder here. You need to harmonize across glossaries as well as ontologies. Next slide and some examples of that. Um, so actually the semantic harmonization cluster has been doing or trying to do some of this with the cryospheric terms. In other words, we've been using the uh, GCW glossary analysis results to provide some definitions for sweet terms to link those sweet terms to ANVO and other OVO foundry ontology terms and uh, other ontologies in general, to build out the ANVO polar subset of ANVO with relevant terms and axioms, and to attribute all of these updates to the people or groups responsible for those changes. Next slide. But I note, this is not a trivial process. We started this two years ago now and we've been meeting weekly for a couple hours a week ever since, and we're not quite done. Next slide. Um, and so if you wanna know what happened to the term inflation, well, we actually haven't even gotten to that term yet. But I do note that SWEET does have the term ablation in the solid phenomenon section. So that's basically processes and ENVO 
does not have the term, but does have the terms ice ablation zone. So they have the area and they have an ice loss process, which has glacial ice loss and glacial ice ablation process as children and subchildren. So there is a start there, but you can tell already, I think, that probably we're going to have an hour long discussion of, of, of uh, how to how to bring these three things together. So next slide. Uh, um, but it can be successfully done. And he here's a couple of examples, thanks to Peer. And, and this is for permafrost. And it's uh, really only a part of what was done in ENVO for permafrost. Um, but it basically claims that Permafrost is an environmental material that has a, a quality of decreased temperature, that it's composed primarily of rock, soil, or sediment. Um, and um, in annotations, it actually has cross links to several other definitions, including the sweet ontology realm soil permafrost term. Next slide. And um, and I should note, this is another example of, of a process um, nivation, which uh, takes snow. So there has to have been a snowfall uh, prior to it um, that uh, transforms that snow that fell um, into nave or fern. And so those are the outputs. And the issue there is that the snow is uh, becoming compacted and granular. Um, so you can do this and, and you can link, um, ontologies directly or through annotations. And, um, I think that's the last slide I had. Um, yes. So turning it over to Pierre. Okay. Thanks Ruth. Um, yeah, so this was really exciting, mostly like from, from, for me as a, ontology engineer or somebody who's building ontologies. I'm also working in the cryosphere, but the fact that Ruth went through all of this, these glossaries is a monumental amount of work um, to bring in that expertise and to help us kind of legitimize the harmonization activities. So this, seg this segment is like, you know, why, why do I think that this counts and or we collectively think that this counts? Because yes, okay, we can harmonize things like Envo and Sweet, but I'm going to provide some examples from like the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and other initiatives that are um, gradually or not so gradually really calling for uh, more harmonized semantics because we have to know what the data is about um, in order to actually integrate it to move it to discover it and it's hard enough within the same country you know the with different projects or grants but scale that across different regions internationally globally different disciplines different stakeholders from science to society it gets complicated uh, next slide please yeah, so you know, we talked about a little bit of that Envo suite harmonization, but there are other harmonization activities, for example, in the ocean um, with BODC. Uh, there was a workshop uh, set up some time ago. Um, Adam Shepard and Danny Kincaid um, helped uh, convene that, or they did convene that in Ireland, and we brought together um, a strategy and a path forward. And uh, I think, you know, when we're finishing up the cryosphere, the next target for me, or one of the next targets for me, would be also to look at these marine vocabularies because. There are data systems emerging right now that need them. And they need more than um, the next best paper. It's not every time we publish one of these new ontologies that maybe they're great, but then you disrupt the whole system and it takes a lot of investment to um, restructure operations. So a kind of um, co-development process where all of these things are emerging at the same time. Yeah, for sure, people can um, run ch um, chunks of them. They get the credit that they need to make sure that everyone is, is benefiting from the growth of these things. But there has to be some sort of infrastructure left behind that's stable um, and predictable enough to build operational systems on top of. Next slide. Right, so you know exactly what does that mean? Well, what does that mean for users especially? Well, if that happens, if if these um, reference ontologies or, or um, terminologies that aspire to be community references, if they are interoperating at source, you know, with expert input like um, Ruth demonstrated, and ESIP is a great uh, place for this to happen in the earth and environment sector, um, 
we're doing this community a, a fairly massive service because then the user doesn't have to worry about choosing one or the other of these. There might be a whole number of reasons why one or the other suits their um, project needs or their or program needs. But in using one, they should be able to use the others because the developers of those, um, as we've demonstrated here in the ZSIP cluster, have gotten together and said, okay, let's, let's cross map with expert input to make sure that people can walk across these different resources. Um, and I think that's, that's really um, one of the major take home messages that I get from this. It should not be up to the user to choose this, especially when you have to deal with like a lot of technical aspects of it. But you know, if we're really serious about building community resources, it's time to you know behave in that way and make sure we interoperate when we build them itself. Uh, next slide. Great. So the examples here it's um, coming from some of my the work that that uh, I chair and uh, lots of people contribute to um, on an ocean data and information system and a project called Ocean Info Hub run by um, IODE um, on behalf of IOC of UNESCO. And the idea there is again to create this kind of um, global ocean uh, data exchange, starting fairly lightweight, um, exchanging metadata back and forth between regional partners so that we know what's in each other's systems, and then gradually building that up into a much more interoperable open data system. Um, next slide. Right, so the three pilot regions, um, and this is in the proceedings of the IOC, so in the IOC IOD meetings, um, there are formal statements to um, accept that this is going to then happen at a um, transnational level. So you'll see the UNESCO style language here. And again, one of the major purposes of this is indeed the transfer of marine technology, the transfer of expertise, matching needs and capacities. So these have consequences. You know, the, the, the way that these systems interoperate and knowing what we're talking about, again, machine readable semantics, knowing what you're talking about in different regions will help rally significant resources to help um, build up a planetary observation system and patch capacity gaps. So that's the context we're operating in. Next slide. And you know, the current thinking of like building these massive hubs that people uh, like smaller projects or other hubs sort of contribute to, um, in some cases it's functional. Like when you have, for example, a global carbon observatory and it, it's, it, it works or the sequence information for, for biodiversity INSDC, you know, it's working quite well. Um, but there are so many emerging hubs and databases and uh, integrated platforms, it's getting really hard to keep track of and they become brutal unless they've secured mandated long term funding. So when that happens, then a lot of the subsidiary nodes are are talking are creating bilateral arrangements. And the whole thing becomes a bit of a mess, especially with the data formats and also just even knowing who has what. So um, next slide. What the IOC system is moving towards is again using the web for what it was designed for as a kind of collective hub to link together the holdings between different nodes. Um, just indexing it with with reliable lightweight metadata and using linked open data and semantic web technologies for machines to help us understand who has what, what is it about, etc. But you see the problem that came up from the global cryosphere watch story. Um, it's rough, you know, it's like we don't we don't know who has what or what they mean when they say they have data on ablation, you know, who's ablation. When and this this is a this is an issue, right? So the harmonization activity, you know, we can't do it all within ESIP, but we can show how it can be done and how it can be done in an inclusive way to include the points of view necessary to come up with a good consensus minimal definition, which can be specialized into you know specialist definitions. That's not a problem, but please let let it be logged somewhere, and let it be logged in, well or multiple places, but let those places interoperate so we know what we're all talking about. Next on. Yeah, so that, that architecture is going to underlie a sort of digital ecosystem, the Ocean Info Hub, which is going to pull together a bunch of IOC resources, uh, including the Ocean Best Practices System, um, OBIS for bio uh, Biodiversity, the World Ocean Databases, many others, and also regional partners, uh, EuroCean, EMODnet, uh, now some collaborators in the Pacific, Latin American regions, Indian Ocean, et cetera. Um, and the idea is that these front ends, like these global hubs, regional hubs, whatever you want, hub of anything, the hub is just a window on a much healthier back end and eco a digital ecosystem at the back end that can be repurposed for emerging threats and very flexibly so by pulling um, pulling together bits and pieces from all of the other nodes to quickly spin up a front end and also to gracefully dissolve it. Therefore, we don't need to mandate like everything needs to be funded forever. We can have focused funding on archives and then like, for example, innovators and scientists can focus on spinning up stuff that's cool um, that makes sense, that's a prototype that shows it can work to attract later funding or re reassign 
um, priorities. So it has a strategic value too. But again, all of this, this is another struggle we have now, we need to start doing this with the marine realm, the harmonization activity, because it's, it's getting tricky to know what people have and for what opportunities and to match resources um, with capacity needs. Next slide. Yeah, so that's the story. Um, this metaphor I've been re referring to is something we're picking up more and more in like the UN data system. You know, you have these multiple digital ecosystems for different compartments and each one needs to start getting healthy so we can splice them together into a kind of planetary digital biosphere. And that's what we're going to need to answer things for the sustainable development goals process. Because some of these questions like about resilient food systems, you're going to need to pull in a, um, a marine data. You're going to need to pull in uh, terrestrial data, city distribution chain, socioeconomic data. And yes, we do have the technologies for linked open data. They're all over the place, but they're still not harmonized. You know, you can query it, you can get it into the right format. It doesn't necessarily matter if people haven't agreed that, all right, this is how we talk about this field. It's a difficult problem, um, but the formats and the technology need a bit of uh, digital diplomacy to make it all fit together. Next. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I said that, sorry. Uh, I skipped ahead of myself, but so please continue, Kai, thanks. Right, um, I'm just putting in some slides. Uh, so Simon Cox and uh, convened a session on fair uh, vocabularies for the CoData Fair Convergence Symposium. Uh, very interesting. And so he's been, he's been working with UNDRR, so Disaster Re uh, Risk Reduction Group, who are coming together and generating glossaries and thesauri for disasters and hazards um, as these increase in a changing world. So um, move on, please. So this is another reason, uh, another area where we're going to need the same kind of thing. So they've assembled a group of experts. They're putting together reports under the auspices of UNDRR. Um, and we, again, if you've seen the next slide, just move one more. We're in the same place as we were with the global cryosphere. Lots of definitions from different groups who have, some of them have, you know, the official capacity to def define these things. We, and when this exists, we're, it's gonna be a really hard time to, to pull together data because we, don't, we haven't even synchronized our knowledge yet. Move on. All right, the same is happening now. Um, so uh, the UN environment reached out to us at ENVO and SDGIO to help create a sort of authoritative classification scheme for marine plastics and marine debris. Um, drawing from previous expert um, work from Gezan and others, and eventually then opening it out to the community so that other experts can join the conversation and uh, uh, grow things. Okay, I see in the chat the digital diplomacy thing. Yep, so that's a, that's a thing. And we have a bunch of uh, digital conferences and meetings to also to help train the next generation of dip, um, diplomats and policymakers, putting in some think tank ideas there in how to include digital to us. So this is my own, this is the last slide. That's it. So the, we need to think about this across the ESIP groups. Um, we need to bring together teams. We have expertise. We have people who know how to build the stuff. And we're thinking about technologies to make it easier, which will be shown also later on. Um, and if we postpone this and kind of just spin up our own things for, and, I, and this word is my like a, a pet peeve of mine, pragmatic reasons, we're taking out semantic debt. It's a hard thing to do. It hurts. It kind of slows things down. But unless we factor it in, we're going to pay a much bigger price, part of which that we're paying now, as uh, I think Mark Schultower and Simon Cox and others can, can testify to. And I think Mark is next to continue this on. Great. Um, thank you. Thanks, Pierre. So um, I think that we, we heard Ruth describe very graphically the, the pain and, and suffering and uh, hardworking fun that we've been having with these semantic harmonization efforts. And, and then Pierre has given, uh, you know, I think us a, a good um, vision for the organizational challenges that we have in front of us. So I'm gonna back up a little bit and talk about some of the uh, principles that we've, we've kind of uh, come across through all of these activities in the semantic harmonization cluster and what what kind of practices might make things easier for us in the future? And, uh, and so that, that picture there um, is really some of the founders of the knowledge representation approach that we're taking, the formal knowledge representation, the diversity is lacking in that photo. So, I mean, in that picture, so at least we've, we've come a, 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 a bit of a way towards addressing that issue. Next. So what we've seen is that vocabularies really are quite variable in both their quality and their scope. Uh, and initially, many of them you can't even find, 
or they're buried in some glass glossary of a PDF or you've got to dig through a website. Sometimes we even find in some of the formalized vocabularies that all we have is the label. It'll say something like grapple and no additional description of what grapple means. We also frequently encounter various errors in the spelling or even errors in the organization and arrangement. Pretty much every vocabulary we look at, we find missing terms. And of course, you know, the bits and pieces that any individual would need are distributed. And perhaps in some ways, most sadly, there's a lot of redundancy of effort. And I think Ruth's example with ablation shows all these groups working very hard to come up with, with nice definitions of the term ablation. And did they really all need to do that independently? Uh, I think several of us would say possibly not. So the second point is that also, to the extent that we're developing these vocabularies somewhat independently, that post hoc alignment is really hard. And again, Ruth has already shown you quite graphically with ablation, the, um, the torturous conversations that we're going to have upcoming to figure out how to model ablation in a common vocabulary you necessarily have to go through vocabularies term by term. If you've got multiple vocabularies, you've got to find the terms. Sometimes the terms might even be using some other, other string, you know, they're synonyms, but they actually mean the same thing. Often the vocabularies represent terms with a different level of granularity. Sometimes you can sort of th say things are kind of more general or more specific. Oftentimes they're simply ambiguous. And then, you know, again, with Ruth's example of ablation, you get these nice detailed text uh, descriptions, but how much of that is really necessarily different as opposed to just sort of idiosyncratic variation because those terms were independently described. And even in some of the most formal uh, vocabularies, we'll find that the way that the terms are axiomatized can even differ. Next. So some practical principles for semantic harmonization. First, vocabularies should be fair. Vocabularies also need governance and one should reuse, revise or extend existing vocabularies before you reinvent. Uh, I think uh, Webster was onto that um, and I had a shot there of his original dictionary cover page. So what do we mean by, yeah, thanks Kai. So you're probably all familiar with fair, but the point is that really vocabularies should be fair as well because vocabularies provide the terms that you use to describe your data, right? And so in a sense you'd say, well, that's metadata, but really the line between metadata and data is pretty, pretty blurry. So I think that we should really start recognizing that it's not just data that needs to be fair, but vocabularies, which are data, also need to be fair. Next slide, please. So let's think about findability. If you're going to use a term to talk about your data, to describe it, or to even describe some other process or phenomenon, what terms should you use? How readily can you find them? Can you search the web for them? And ideally, if you're looking for a term, you can return to that term. So when you do a search, you want to be able to go specifically to the term that you're interested in using and see some more information about it. And to facilitate that return to, for reusability, you also need to have a unique identifier. So that unique identifier helps you disambiguate that term from other terms, and it has that refindability, reusability advantage. Next slide. So you need a globally unique identifier. The best practice here would be that you have a dereferenceable HTTP IRI. That means that you can paste that IRI into a web browser and you can learn about what that term is. It also means that if that vocabulary is structured in a machine actionable way, you can have some automated processing. We also want to be able to describe every term. 
We shouldn't have what we call just a naked term, a terse descriptor like an RDFS label. It's minimal, it's, but it's really insufficient. You need more detail. So we would recommend that you use fields like the Dublin core description or RDFS comment, SCOS definition, or there are some well-established uh, ontologies like the information artifact ontology. These are, by using these formal labels, applications can consistently interpret your terms. Finally, it's really nice if you arrange your terms in hierarchies and a best practice here would be to use an RDFS subclass of or um, an OWL equivalent. And the reason for this is that sometimes when you just, for instance, have a, a label or what we'd call a naked term, you can sort of infer what it is by looking at where it might sit in a class hierarchy. And it also class hierarchies obviously have advantage in terms of query expansion for search. Next. So findable and accessible. Accessible means that it's, your vocabulary should be open access. There shouldn't be paywalls. I think, for instance, a lot of the, uh, the ISO standards do in fact have a sort of a paywall. We should remember that our terms shouldn't be something that we reference from a hard copy or some glossary of a PDF. It's got to be at the end of a dereferenceable HTTP IRI acquired and referenced by the web. And the way that that can happen most effectively is by adopting some standard syntaxes and structures. Next. So for interoperability, well, luckily we have some very nice standards coming from the W3C, like uh, W3C's OWL, the RDF um, resource data framework, the Sparkle querying language, and Shackle. Also of, of current major interest is the schema.org effort, which isn't really a W3C endorsed effort, but it is supported by the major search engines. And it is, it is actually based on the, un, an underlying RDF-ish model. And it will really play extremely well with some of the more complex and domain specific vocabularies that schema.org does not address, uh, but uh, various domains are addressing. And at this point, I'd like to also point out there is an ESIP cluster called science on schema.org, which is really looking at schema.org as a formal vocabulary and how to use it most advantageously uh, in the earth science realm. So I'd really recommend you all, if you have an interest in this area, you should uh, look at the, the uh, aside from the semantic harmonization cluster, the science on schema.org cluster. And then design pattern, oh, sorry. Design patterns are, are, are these ways of talking about common phenomenon in a consistent way. So for instance, something like a trajectory, where when we say that you all have an idea of what a trajectory is, it's, it's got a start point, it's got an end point, it might have a, a time, a duration for travel. Um, that can be designed using these RDF and OWL and Shackle frameworks and promoting and reusing those when possible is really, really useful. Next. So reusabilities, again, not just labels. When someone looks up a term, provide useful information, such as definitions or descriptions. Also links to related terms. So you get a lot of the richness of the semantic web from how you relate one term to another. So not just the hierarchical relationship, but also what sort of process and events and activities terms might be uh, relevant uh, participants in. And finally, again, they should have unambiguous and globally unique identifiers. Next. So here's an example of what we mean by a fair vocabulary. You can see in the upper right, uh, uh, excuse me, upper left, there's this term palsa, which is coming from the cryospheric uh, vocabulary. Um, palsa, this is the, uh, a shot from a ontology repository called ontob.org. There are several repositories. ESIP has one called CORE, the Community Ontology Repository. BioPortal is another well-known one. What they can do is they can take these formal vocabularies, these formal fair vocabularies, and render them for use both by machines via an API and through, as you can see here, rendered on a web page 
for, for human interpretation. You can see that there's a globally unique and persistent HTTP URI identifier associated with that label PALSA. And then there's a definition. In this case, it's the IO, IAO definition um, class that was used to define what a PALSA is. So it's very useful to see. Going down further to the right, you can see there's even more detail using the RDFS comment field. And then finally going down, you can see the class hierarchy and we can understand that, oh, PALSA is a type of frost heave and it's an elevated phenomenon. Finally at the bottom, and this is, again, this is the uh, environment ontology, you can see that there are even further axioms here talking about how a PALSA is part of an ice lands, it's surrounded by permafrost. You can put a lot of useful additional information for machine processing, as well as for humans to better understand what this phenomenon PALSA is. Next. Okay, so vocabulary should be fair. They also need governance. So Pierre, I think really spoke well to this. We should not be out on our own building vocabularies. Ideally, we have a community to develop and vet the vocabulary. You also need mechanisms for maintaining access to that vocabulary, as well as correcting it, revising it, etc. And always the long-term sustainability of these vocabularies is questionable. So this is an area where ESIP may be able to really help. I mentioned the Community Oncology Repository because when you have these vocabularies, you can upload them to a repository that provides a way of potentially dereferencing your persistent IRIs and maintaining a functional framework. So it should be open and collaborative. And finally, I think it should provide support for people who are, have questions about how to use that framework. Next. So reuse, extend and revise, please don't reinvent. And there's a lot of earth science vocabularies that do exist. I've listed a few here. Some of those do not exist in an optimal um, uh, framework such as RDF or OWL. So they need to be modernized and harmonized and extended and revised. And as Ruth and Pierre have indicated, that's not an easy thing to do. So it's better to do it sooner rather than later. And finally, I wanna point out as well that there are some general vocabularies that exist at, such as schema.org and Dublin Core. And we should reuse the terms from those vocabularies as much as we can, instead of again, reinventing them. Next. If the vocabularies are fair, why does that make them easier to align? Because we can use features like an OWL equivalent class, OWL same as, or even the much milder SCOS related to interrelate terms and enable uh, uh, cross vocabulary usage. Ideally though, things could be interoperable out of the box. If we use the same syntaxes and languages for expression, and then you can pick and choose your needed terms from multiple vocabularies. And I think many of this are doing this at least somewhat already. Next. So these are our choices. Um, are we going to continue constructing the Tower of Babel, which might lead us to the left rather than to the right? So um, Ruth showed how, you know, the nuanced defin how nuanced definitions can get. Um, it's, it's not easy reconciling or even developing these vocabularies. So now Kai Blumberg is going to show us a nifty uh, way to make that easier. Thanks. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone. And I just wanna help to speak to some of these issues and how community existing efforts and solutions can help to address them. And so here we'll get a little more into the weeds with some tools and some examples of tools that can be help to implement everything that was just described by our speakers. Um, so I just wanna kind of zoom back out really quickly. So within there, are, as, as was mentioned before, there are very, there are a lot of different standards, existing communities, et cetera. Um, so what we're gonna be, what I'm gonna be speaking, speaking to specifically today 
is tools within the context of the OBO foundry, so the Open Biological Biomedical Ontology Foundry, um, to which ENVO is a part, but many other ontologies as well, such as the gene ontology, the chemical entities of biological interest, KEBI, et cetera. And so I want to bring to everyone's attention that there do exist some really great tools that have been developed within this framework, but these tools, what I'll be showing today, are within the are used within the context of ENVO, but I want to stress that this does not need to be just within ENVO. These tools are more general and can be used within other structures as well. So if you wanted to just work on another project that was outside of the OVO Foundry, you could make use of these tools as well um, to create your own OWL. And so this is gonna be more of a demo and more of an explanation of a particular workflow, but I just wanna show that, I really wanna stress that we're doing our best to try and make this as easy as possible for you, for people who are not necessarily ontology experts, but might have some sort of stake in this. You might need to have your data, you, know, you might need to be trying to manage repositories, large data sets, et cetera. There are many, many different stakeholders and use cases, and we want to help bring you in. And so here is our way of trying to reach out. This is our attempt at an olive branch. I promise we won't bite um, to try and make this easier for you. So what I'll, speak, what I'll be showing specifically is this Envo template tool. So it's, it's this link here. It's the Envo um, robot template workflow, which like I said, here is I'm showing it for the purposes of Envo. But like I said, this could be used for other um, examples and tools. For example, I'm doing this also in my work for Bico Demo, um, where we're helping to bring in Obo ontologies to cover their, our data holdings there. And so I just really want to stress that um, this is intended for non-ontologists and we have a lot of steps and tools to like help make this easier for you. I probably said that twice now, so I'll stop saying that. Um, finally, the way, so just kind of as an overview of how this works, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, what this workflow shows at a very high level is kind of some steps in order to get you going if you choose to engage with us or with this or these tools and so what we, what we can do is we can organize um, our new term requests into standardized um, documents or standardized Excel type sheets. So tabular data, like such as a Google sheet. And then these temp, this tool gives step-by-step -step guidance on how to fill these out. And then finally the protocols for, you know, the um, more ontology, the backend ontology um, folks such as myself to help convert these into OWL. So what you can do from this is you, you can take your existing CSVs, terms that you would like to add to an ontology such as ENVO. In this case, it's ENVO, but like I said, this could be repurposed elsewhere for other ontologies. But the point is you, you might have your glossary, you might have your thesaurus, et cetera, and you want to participate. You've said, yes, I agree with what the previous speakers have said. Please, I want in. Here's a way to do it. Um, so this allows you to bring your glossary that's in an Excel sheet or something similar and put it into OWL and some steps along the way to make that all happen. So I will um, leave the presenter mode here and I will um, show some of these examples. So going on, clicking on this first link, we get to our, um, the page here. This can be found within the slides. Um, it's posted in several places. Another way to get to this is it's on the wiki page of the environment ontology. So the F for anyone who is interested, so the environment ontology, you could find it here. So within GitHub, the environment ontology, and then the wiki page, and we have our merge and workflow um, page here. So anyway, it's linked before, so you can get to it. But the point, of this is that we outline in what I hope is clear and simple wording how to do this. And we'd love to welcome feedback and comments, et cetera. So we have some steps for collaborators and we have some steps for the ontology engineers in the back end. So just at a very high level, the workflow is kind of as follows. So you can create an issue on our GitHub page, then you can um, get your own copy our template sheet, which will help create the ontology formatted for Envo. And then, then there's a bunch of steps on how to fill out the prepared terms. So some details about using these, this tool, some details about 
you know, the, the labels, the classes, the definitions, et cetera. So I'm just going to walk through a couple examples of this and I'll show some kind of before and after. So we'll treat this like a cooking show. We'll, we'll do some of the steps and then we'll pull out of the oven the final demonstration. So let's say you are, I'm speaking to you as collaborators who are interested in engaging with us in these sorts of activities. So the first thing to do is to create an issue on our, on our GitHub page. Um, so that will link you here. So here, for example, is the Envo issue, Envo GitHub issue page. Um, and so here you could ask, um, you know, you could, you could create a new issue and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm really interested in creating um, such and such terms. I'm a glaciologist. I need these types of glaciers. Da, da, da. I noticed that you might not have them, et cetera. So um, it would link, yeah, so it will link you to our Envo GitHub issue page and there, you can um, create, and it's described in the workflow, kind of what to do and how to process this. Um, so it gives you, uh, then what will happen is you can, you can go to this uh, template here, which is linked in the protocol. And it's a Google doc that is the formatting appropriate for um, this workflow. So you can go to that and it will give you this basic template, which you can then go and fill out. Um, so for example, so this has everything that um, we could use or would want to add. Potentially there's some extra things you don't need to fill out all of it and all of the details are shown in the protocol, but on what you'd want to add um, in order to get some new terms in and help facilitate us to review this process. And what I wanna stress is that the idea of this is that it helps to kind of create more complex machine readable ontology OWL files from a tabular format that we're more familiar working in. And so it's a chance to not only help get it into the more complicated format, but also to just structure our own data and vocabularies and see what we actually want and need in a concise tabular way, which a glossary might be structured like that anyway. Um, so once, once that's done, you can grab that own sheet and you start um, adding your terms in as well. And then finally, you can use it and these destructions to fill it out. So. And it's all, it's all described here. Um, I'm not trying to read all of it, but I'm just trying to give a, a brief overview about it. So within the, um, yeah, so, so let's just go to our little demo. So I've pulled up a, um, here is an example. So let's say um, you were someone such as Ruth and you were interested in partnering with us and making something such as a term such as grain of snow or something along these lines or, or many terms, but I just wanna pull up one example here. So. Here's just a nice concise way of organizing this thing, um, your, your request. So like I said, each column in this workflow will get translated by this tool into the nicer, uh, cleaner ontology code. So what'll happen is you can fill out what you think all of these fields ought to be. And we give instructions and advice about what all of them are and what, how to do it, how, what does it mean? And of course you can ask us for questions or help along the way, or if you join with this call, perhaps this could be a regular ongoing activity. However you wanna use this, um, we're trying to reach out and get people to engage with us. And that's the point of all this. Um, so like, like uh, Mark was saying, so the first thing is like a label or one of the first things is a label, which as he was saying alone is insufficient, but it's a good start. And it's the, the first thing, the first thing you'll see the name of the term. So here, for example, if you wanted to, Ruth wanted to describe a term such as grain of snow, because that's included in those price, uh, those polar watch uh, glossaries. And so um, that's pretty straightforward. You know, we, we figured that out there. Yeah. Then another thing that's really useful um, when we're building ontologies and uh, the other spoke to this too a little bit is kind of these superclass subclass relationships. You can think of them like parent and children relationships, you know, like I came from this or I am a, I'm a more specific version of this. It's not exactly like a parent. I'm not my dad and like slightly different. I'm, I'm a, I'm a human, which makes me some sort of homo sapien. But anyway, the point is that um, all of the information here, and I hope it's concise and understandable kind of helps to guide you through how one might do this. And we also um, provide some links about how to explore Envo and how to figure out what the parent might be. So as you're going along and filling out these kinds of things, and again, you can ask for help along the way, but please do try and read the uh, workflow first. You can go and see what you might be missing or how to, how to get there. So in order to discover terms, you can browse them from here. 
And I, I put a link to um, another one of the ontology browsers that um, Mark didn't mention, the ontology lookup service, which is my personal favorite. Um, and you can look for your term of interest. So in case you were interested in rock, you might find it there. And you can go to it and you can um, figure out, okay, I'm making a sedimentary rock or something of that sort. And so I'm going to make the subclass there. So in this case, grain of snow, um, we made a subclass to ice mass. And we could go and figure out where ice mass is. We could browse it from this link. Maybe we could uh, do a little demo of that. And we can navigate and find it. Um, another thing that we could do, another thing that we have linked here is a, a page specifically about navigating Envo. And because I know that Envo is, is large, there's a lot in there. Um, some of the top level terms can be a little confusing to non-ontologists or to the uninitiated. So we've tried to make this documentation to help explain how you can just get your feet wet. And so we've got um, sections on viewing Envo, viewing it on the web, viewing it in Protege, examples of how to do that, um, examples of the Envo hierarchies and to browse them and to kind of get started. So here it lays out kind of some, this is not comprehensive of everything in Envo, but it's a lot of the basic things that might be relevant to people who are trying to get some terms in. So we have um, explanations of kind of our top, not top level, but our what you can consider to be kind of upper level terms, such as environmental material, um, astronomical body parts. Some could say it might be like an environmental feature. Um, it's, it's along those lines. And it, this documentation explains what it is, how it got to be that way. Biomes, um, environmental system processes, object quality sites, et cetera. Um, yeah, so like I said before, you can follow these documentations. It'll help um, guide you through the process. So we can look through, and then when you've clicked on this, it'll show you a term. So you could go and search. You could uh, browse the graph. So you're interested in rocks. You could um, go and search there. And you can see, like what Steve was showing before, or sorry, what Mark was showing before, um, it, it shows the hierarchy, it shows the definition, it shows the IRI, et cetera. Um, so that's one way, and all of its children, et cetera. So if you wanted to add a new type of rock, you could go and figure out what rocks are already there, et cetera. Um, viewing Envo and Protege, we have some def a little description of that here. So for those who have used Protege, there's a, you, know, you can follow these tools on how to do that. Um, and then a little bit about the Envo hierarchies. Um, I don't want to get too, too much into this, but basically the long and short is that um, there are these top level hierarchies that would be kind of the starting place for novice users to try and help figure out where their terms should go. So within the material hierarchy, um, the, so the, the material hierarchy, which, you know, things such as soil, seawater, snow, or the, well, the astronomical body part hierarchy, which we kind of think about um, things that you might show up on the surface of a planet like Earth. So like a plane or a lake or a volcano. Um, and then we have other hierarchies such as biome, which are meant to kind of ref reflect the World Wildlife Foundation biomes. And um, there's some examples there. These are used within the MIXS standards uh, for genomic data. Um, environmental system processes. So these are th things, you know, which occur kind of with a, some sort of time frame to them. So erosion, acidification, ocean acidification, lightning strikes, those sorts of things. And then finally, some, um, not finally, and then we have physical object qualities. So we can kind of understand how the, how the model works. So we, a quality, something like red, because um, you know, it's, it's showing up elsewhere, but for, for our purposes, environmental scientists or in the like, we might be interested in terms such as porosity of soil or temperature of air, concentration of some sort of chemical in an environmental material and those sorts of things. So a little bit of more documentation there about where they are and what they kind of mean. And then finally, we have things like sites, which might include um, such something such as a protected area, an oasis, an archaeological site, a environmental site, conservation site, those sorts of things. Okay, so once you kind of had a chance to like look through and see where things might fall within the the you know within the broader knowledge base of Envo, then you could start to actually start to fill this out. So you went and found out that um, a grain of snow maybe would make sense under ice mass. Um, and so then you'd suggest, okay, I think maybe an appropriate parent class is ice mass. And of course, if you're going through this kind of process and you're not sure, feel free to just ask questions or, you know, 
work it through. Then the next thing, and this is really important within um, how we build ontologies, is to try and structure a definition. And of course, there are many different ways of writing definitions as the other people spoke to. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing it, of course, but one of the ways that we like to try and make things um, simple, comprehensible, and also help with determining the appropriate superclass is to kind of follow a genus differentia structure, and A is a B which sees. So for example, an ice mass. So for example, a land ice mass, a class like this, we could say it's an ice mass which is formed over land. So something simple along those lines where it's a concise definition. And of course, there's a lot more that could be said about this. Um, but the point of this whole workflow and protocol is that we kind of give some ideas and examples of how one could go about doing this. And then by helping, by you helping to engage with us and to start to do this work on your own, it helps to facilitate the process of reviewing this and, and really getting it into Envo so that other people are not, um, so that we as a team who have limited time to, to help with this can really you know, maximize our, the use of everyone's time. So really trying to help you to get um, things in order such that we can incorporate it into the, the wider knowledge graph um, and be beneficial to everyone. Yeah, so this exercise really helps to formulate these kinds of definitions. So I don't wanna to speak too, too much to this now. I um, also do wanna leave time for questions. And then finally, there are just many other fields that can be filled out. So comments, um, as Mark was saying, RDFS comments, citations, um, we give a little bit about there and how to add citations to a definition, to a comment, just to make sure that everything's nicely cross-referenced. Um, and then other things like synonyms, you know, it gives some explanation about different types of synonyms, what they all mean, how you can use them. Um, things like cross-references. So this is what we can use to help link to, other, um, link to other ontologies or vocabulary systems. So for example, suite, um, this is how we can link out to suite. And so this has been helpful in our work, um, harmonizing Envo and suite. And finally, there's a, a section on axioms. Um, this is a little bit more complicated and we state in the protocol that this is not something we would expect novice users to, to try and tackle, but instead maybe just make some comments about some sort of um, relationships that you might want this term to um, link out to. And there's some examples there, but again, I don't wanna to spend too much time on that one. And so what, what, what happens is as we're filling this out, um, and this can be group work that's facilitated, um, Google Docs, it's not the perfect solution, but it's, it's, a, it's a way that we can all share our spreadsheets together and then once this is all done, it gets merged in. So this is a, kind of a temporary thing, but in the interim, it's a place that can be shared. Many people can work on it. You can all review it amongst ourselves, amongst with us, with your own teams, et cetera. Um, and simply by following this kind of formatting structure that we've helped set up here, it makes it possible to actually bring this in very quickly, um, pending review, of course, which can take some time, but the, the, the actual the mechanics are very simple once it's formatted correctly and everyone has agreed to it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a lot of this. So um, we've, we've made our term, we've this allowed us to put in as much information as we can prior to review from a larger team, um, definitions, um, references for our definitions, comments, um, references for those, synonyms, et cetera. And so like in a cooking show, um, so, the after, so after this is all done, um, what'll happen is then the, the, the protocol explains, okay, we, we've done this, we can push all these things, we're gonna do, do a couple of steps. And then once that's all done, um, like someone like me can help take care of this, then we can actually um, go into Envo and you can see now, so when we search for this, so now within this um, version, this hasn't been merged into the main branch of Envo yet, but it will be soon, hopefully. And um, you can now see that this is going to be a new Envo term. And here you can see it already, how it will look when it's completed. So you can see now just from this basic um, spreadsheet, we've actually gotten to a more sophisticated um, system, a knowledge, an ontology, um, which is higher up that semantic ladder, which was shown a couple of slides on a couple of slides. And now we actually have it in this format that is machine readable, searchable, et cetera. Um, 
the labels, the definitions, et cetera. And it's all in there. Um, axioms as well. And so this is, this is a really powerful um, way of taking your data or your information that you might want to partner with us or with another ontology or et cetera, getting it nice and clean and organized and actually getting it into OWL, getting it into a system which can then be shared on the web and everyone's data systems can point to it and we can all um, get to somewhere more meaningful. So with that, I think I've taken enough time just on this basic um, setup, but if there are any questions, um, perhaps we can do this now or later afterward, because um, we also have some, some things from some of our other speakers that we'd like to show as well. There, there's some questions in the chat, Kai, but I think we should move to the video from the Ag and the Climate uh, Group. Great, thanks. Let's do that. Okay. So like I said, everything's linked there and uh, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be happy to help with these sorts of activities. Um, okay, so we have some slides from the soil ontology from Kate and we also have a video from Brian. Um, I'm not sure if Kate is around or if Brian yes. is around. Yes, Kate, would you I like think, to? I think that Brian's on the list on the agenda first for his. Okay, sorry, the, the slides are just in reverse order. Would, would you like to go now, Kate? Or sure. Okay. Um, so uh, the Soil Ontology and Informat Informatics Cluster, uh, we just formed this fall. Um, we got certified the, around the new year. So this is a brand making new ESIP cluster. And um, the explicit mission is to uh, connect soil research, the soil research community and those uh, research tools to incorporate soil data to develop better tools for research. So really what we're focused on here is developing informatics tools to connect different soil um, databases or soil products that have been archived online. Um, and if you can go on to the next slide, to illustrate some of the challenges with this, um, this is a collection of some of the products that I'm aware of that different groups have um, archived on different repositories or just posted a downloadable URL. Um, the soil community is still at the stage where you will get pointed to Excel spreadsheets to download off of an organization's web page. Um, so the data model for all of these, uh, some of them have developed independently. So the Soil Health Database, Van Gessel and Crother, all of those were individual PIs who developed their own data model and their own um, vocabulary sort of based on information they were interested in scraping together. Um, and then the, the other um, diagram here sort of shows an evolution of a couple of different data products that are more interrelated. So uh, the International Soil Carbon Network uh, drew on NRCS. Um, so this is a, a US Kellogg Soil Science Laboratory um, data set uh, with influence on a second data set focused on soil survey data, WOSIS. Um, and merge that with a data product from uh, Ameriflux, which focused more on ecosystem flux, to sort of kludge together um, a data product focused on organic carbon, soil organic carbon stocks. Um, from this, there were two groups that spun off. One was that was particularly interested in radiocarbon and fractionation data. So they developed uh, a, a data model to try to capture different fractionation methods um, and collapsed and, and abandoned certain aspects of the ISCN data model. Um, the, the soil uh, data uh, harmonization project focused on long-term observation studies, so neon type data. Um, the part of the challenges one thing that made uh, the, the soda more interesting um, was that they moved from sort of a data entry trade data transcription approach to a scripted data merge approach, um, which is unusual in the soils community. Um, so they had a little bit more, they maintained a little bit more provenance with each of their data streams. Um, and uh, finally, the incubation data. Um, the, spun off of, of, of ISRAD, um, similar with uh, soil carbon, a group that was particularly interested in soil and coastal carbons. Um, the incubation and the coastal carbons mostly focused on downscoping the data model from um, ISRAD, uh, which ended up being quite expansive. 
So this is just what I'm personally aware of in the soil carbon research space. With the move towards archiving data onto repositories, there's actually a whole bunch of soil data on there, and it's all an extremely diverse data structure. So trying to put it back together is a big lift, and there seems to be um, informatics tools that could make that easier. And so with the next um, next slide, so that's what the um, this cluster is sort of tasked with doing. Um, so recently we did a review of the soil data products, um, which I, uh, a slightly more expansive list than the one I went over in the past slide. Um, and if you're interested in it, that was a funded ESIP lab project. Um, right now we're looking at developing some kind of harmonization tool focused on soil biogeochemical data. Um, bulk density seems to be a good candidate for a first pass. Um, and then we're going to take these tools and implement them in uh, ISCN to um, try to develop a bit more of a community resource for soil scientists. And you are welcome to come join us. We meet every other week. Um, we're alternating between a morning meeting and an evening meeting, East Coast time, um, to try to hit both uh, US, Europe, and Australia. With that, I probably took more than two minutes, but happy to answer any questions if folks have them. All right. Thanks, Kathy. Great, so we have this prepared from Brian. Um, I hope that this will work. Um, I hope that the audio, um, we'll see, let me know if you can't hear the audio. Um, but let's let's try and listen and see if it, it will work. My name is Brian Reed. Bill Payne and I can everyone hear the audio or is there an issue? Yep, can hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it works. Okay. I co lead the My name is Brian Reed. Bill Payne and I co lead the agriculture and climate cluster. What we wanted to do was to show how this document called the Climate 21 Project Transition Memo for the USDA, how this document related to other documents in a Neo4j database. The other documents could comprise things like legislation, uh, scholarly article, meaning publications, or even uh, selected uh, sustainable development goal targets. So what we did I'll show you the result of a query that we ran, and I'll show you, I'll describe to you how we did it. This is a, a query result that shows how that document, the Climate 21 document, relates to um, public scholarly publications shown here in green that are joined through common terms found in ontologies um, that are here described in the color here in blue. The, Yellow colored notes are data products. These are NASA data products that connect to those publications. And if you zoom in, the, the ontology terms are things like climate change, forestry, ranch, planning, and so on and so forth. So the ontologies that we used um, to figure out these relationships were uh, ENVO, AGRO, and food on food ontology. Food ontology. There was a a uh, program that Tom Nayrock wrote about a year and a half ago that we modified to scan through these documents and pick out those terms that corresponded to terms in those ontologies. Great, so thanks for that, Brian. Um. Yeah, I think, you know, and in a sort of broader perspective, so ontologies like food on and agro, uh, they came out of Envo because they approached us and said, hey, look, we're, we're um, agriculture experts, we're food experts. Um, we noticed you're doing something here in Envo. And I'm like, you know, please take it. Uh, we'll show you how to set up your own ontology and run it um, because this is, it's huge, right? So I think that's like one, another, another way of semantic harmonization in the sense of finding the right clusters of experts and technical experts and domain experts, empowering them, and then setting up, you know, a collaboration. Um, that's how it goes. Yeah, so with that, so here's our details for our um, group. You can find us in our mailing lists, our wiki page, and you can join us. Um, we're on the ESIP schedule, but it's roughly every third Wednesday of the month, although it's a little bit more than that, um, 2 p.m. Eastern time usually.
Well, I'm broadly interested in whether other clusters are, are interested in, in using this type of methodology and these types of principles to help them become a little bit more semantic in their, in their vocabulary efforts and metadata efforts also. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, um, this is Matthew Biddle with um, the Marine Data Cluster, and I, I think this is this is amazing. Um, one of the reasons the Marine Data Cluster got started up was um, a difficulty in finding the appropriate controlled vocabulary to use to describe your oceanographic observations. Um, and so, one of the things we're we're actually putting together, we put together a 90 minute session in February on controlled vocabularies and getting a representative from each of the um, few uh, vocabularies that we've, that we're aware of to, to come in and present their, their views and, you know, how their vocabularies are used um, and the governance and, and things like that. But I think this is, this is an awesome effort and I think it would be extremely useful to have you guys come in and maybe give give a little presentation to the marine data cluster to to show some of the ways that these um, this harmonization can facilitate a lot of the interoperability at least within the marine data community I don't know if um, anyone if Carolina has anything else this is Gary again this is that sounds very hopeful. I would suggest that people that are interested in this could look a little bit at the patterns that ENVO has as examples of how you might maximize and harmonize your vocabularies. Both Pierre and Mark mentioned patterns, and that's a very good starting point also. It could be. And also, you know, in the UN decade, there's a broader drive to bring in um, regional vocabularies and terminologies and again, do the harmonization, so not necessarily merging with one or the other, um, if you have a long-term mandate, but allowing them to actually cross-talk. So, for example, in the U.S., there's this um, uh, CMEX uh, standards, Coastal Marine Ecosystem Classification System. So we reached out to them, um, and they're like, yeah, let's, let's, let's think about how to do it and express it with a more expressive OWL standard. And so we've been working away at that slowly, again, you know, um, so for the ocean decade, there is a need of this. There's a specified need for this. And if you are cataloging those, or if you have uh, members in that cluster with smaller or local vocabularies, but they know they work for their purposes, that's really important to get them exposed and federated um, with others that are, let's say, more widely known, um, so that they're not ignored and we don't redo the work. You know, we point to them instead or create some sort of import, uh, bilateral import. So yeah, yeah, happy to do that. Um, Happy to sort of inform you on what the plans are on the ocean side. I think uh, myself, Kai is involved too. I know Adam Shepard and things, maybe that would be interesting to do a schema.org um, uh, intervention alongside that because those two worlds converge around sharing of marine data. That's certainly the UNESCO strategy. We're using both. Yeah, I believe Adam Shepard had mentioned that, and he was, you know, saying maybe the Beco Depot representatives and Envo representatives could be there as well. Yeah, that would be that would be really cool because uh, it's a way of like reinvigorating some of that work we started off in Dublin some time ago, back in the the glory days of travel, um, and it would be nice to pick that up again because uh, there's a lot of good energy, good people, uh, and a lot of people who can be trained. You know, it's a it's. A good time. So marine for sure, soil, as we heard from Kath, is another area where we could uh, do that. I know Simon Cox has like a whole bunch of resources from the Australians on soil um, semantics. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff to start off right right away. We'd also like to give a chance to any other groups um, who might be interested or wanted to speak up with the discovery cluster or the physical samples, et cetera. If there's anyone from those or other clusters who want to speak up, please feel free. So Steve, Steve, you mentioned um, your project working on like geoforms and things. I mean, I think that's a like core ESIP concern. Uh, I mean, that connects to GIS systems, et cetera, very smoothly. Um, any more information on that or how a semantic harmonization can help? Can it help? Would it be useful? Uh, which Steve, were you talking to Steve Richard? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, Steve yeah. Richard. Yeah, so, um, well, the, in the, the IUGS CGI group has 
for, there's this commission for geoscience information in the International Union of Geoscientists that got involved with, with uh, interoperability for geologic data largely and led to the development of, the, of uh, GeoSIML, which you may have heard of. It's an XML markup language for interchange, but along with that, we developed a whole set of vocabularies for populating um, data. And uh, those are all SCOS vocabularies. I put a link in the in the chat there for for where they where they are. GeoSIML.org is the way to get into that. Um, currently, um, there's an activity going on that involves several geologic surveys and some um, academic groups in in Australia to uh, try to develop a system for streamlining making 3D geologic models. And in connection with that, we're what we're trying to do is formalize a lot of the uh, the, the thinking that went into the GeoSIML conceptual model is an OWL ontology um, in, this, in this Loop 3D project. And uh, hopefully that, you know, that work will be able to wrap around then and, and connect back in with harmonizing that. Um, I think probably more with Envo, but there's also a lot of things in Suite, which of course could be aligned um, probably along the lines of the database reference kind of links um, because the semantic connections are, are pretty loose. And so that works ongoing. Um, we should have a first draft of the of a ontology. Um, it's in, it's all in GitHub, but the GitHub's still a project GitHub. We're going to open it up. Hopefully, I can talk Boyan into doing that in the next several weeks, and uh, get it out there for a wider wider um, look and and testing and start thinking about trying to integrate that and and uh, with with Envo and some of the other other ontologies people are working with. In the uh, work on the CGI vocabularies is interesting. We used a very similar approach to what Kai was saying. We had a basically a spreadsheet template that we used that um, various that we had a work group with each vocabulary that worked on compiling the definitions first in a spreadsheet um, with just you know assign, identifying parent child relations or subclass relations within the spreadsheet and, and working really focusing on writing definitions that were logically consistent. And then once we had the once we had that set up and, and the, it was all reviewed in the spreadsheets and the final step was just transforming the spreadsheet into SCOS. And I think when we did this almost 10 years ago, we basically had an XSLT that just read the the uh, spreadsheet XML and transformed it into SCOS. It was pretty straightforward, um, but mm -hmm. hard to maintain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so no, it's, I think interesting, that, it's interesting to hear. And also like, you know, thinking back to Mark's uh, discussion points, you, you know, there's this, so it, it can easily be sound like, again, where you're developing something that already has correlates and other um, ontologies, but often there's a there's a niche that you're targeting that's not covered by the others. Um, so like, is, was that part of the design uh, decisions for this? In the, the loop 3D, you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So the big focus there is supporting development of 3D geologic models. So a lot mm -hmm. of it has to do with trying to capture the relationships between geologic features, faults and contacts, rock bodies and intrusions. A lot of a lot of those kinds of things is is uh, but it really is a, a pretty broad ontology. And I'm working with Boyan Broderick on this and, and he's been working really hard on trying to to build this thing in a framework that was consist that's consistent with some of the uh, higher level ontologies like BFO or, and uh, we've kind of been, parts of it are BFO like and parts of it are Dolce like. It's an interesting conversation for those who are interested in those details, yeah. <laughs> but- um, That's interesting. So like, like I like, so that's, that's interesting because, you know, we have things that are um, operational on a community level, which make a commitment to one like Envo, right? But then right. there are spaces like there are things in the innovation space, like you just described here, which are necessary for the growth of those operational things because they challenge like, um, you know, well, maybe it's better to do it this way. And so we need both of those activities running on. And I think I point to like some of the stuff in the semantic tech cluster, you know, I think you've, you've been involved there, like creating this federation, the serene federation for semantic resources for earth and environment. I think yeah, that's yeah. where we kind of place these activities to make sure that they're not, um, like overly redundant, you know, some redundancy is expected, but so that we know like who's working on what, like, it sounds like this is a cool bridge to actual GIS systems and 3d modeling, um, as well as, uh, showing like fusion of upper level stuff, which is super interesting. You know, we need to loosen that up a little bit, but at the same time, I can't do it from the Envo side because we have a bunch of projects relying on operations, right? right. So 
it'd be really interesting to, to find a way to bridge that in a kind of principled manner. Interesting. So, so what's serene? Um, what is, uh, I'm not serene. sure. Yeah. Is, is that what's. So we, we talked about this thing last winter and we've been sort of putting it together. It's yeah. like, a, it's a federation so that we can kind of like gather up the semantic resource efforts for earth and environment. Um, uh, you can hear more about that. Uh, you can check out the, the, the previous stuff. I can put some links in too. Um, it's kind of like basically getting organized with all of our semantics activity because it's getting much more popular. Like Lewis and I were sort of, and, and others in this call, we're musing about how this would be like half a session some years ago at ESIP, and now that's like all over the place. Semantics are everywhere. And so that's great. But of course, um, we want to make sure that somehow there is a kind of, we're all adding up to something at the end that we can bring towards operational systems. So Serene was an idea to create a kind of federation for this. You can check out in our ESIP Slack space, um, there's a semantic tech channel, and you can see some, some discussions on Serene there. Oh, good. OK, thanks. Um, yeah. Pierre, Pierre, I have a, I know we're about to close up here. Um, I have a question for you specifically on the topic of digital diplomacy. I think it was mentioned earlier and I'll put in the comments. So the, the work which is ongoing here in the harmonization space, I, I think is um, extremely noteworthy, uh, particularly outside of ESIP. We're making progress on, I think, more of the clusters in ESIP uh, taking notice of, of the type of um, in some sense, groundbreaking uh, progress which has been made here over the last number of years. Um, but I can't, I can't help but think that that really nobody truly wants to be doing or engaged in the process of semantic harmonization. You know, with with enough foresight years ago, you know, this this wouldn't really have been necessary. But that's not reality. The reality is that it is necessary. But it, but it also reminds me of of the kind of issue of plastics entering the ocean where we can clean up the ocean, but we're ultimately always going to be cleaning up the ocean if we don't attack the source of plastics entering the ocean or trash entering the ocean. And I wonder, as part of that digital diplomacy, and we're never going to make, a, 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 get a solution for this just now. We're at, we're at well, local time 12.30 here. But as part of that digital diplomacy, I wonder if the cluster has had a think about um, how, how to encourage you know, the semantic harmonization from the get-go rather than, you know, another cryosphere, part of cryospheric uh, terminology coming along, vocabulary coming along, which means that some of these activities maybe need to be, be repeated. Maybe that's just food for thought. It's well too late on in the session, but it, it certainly falls, I, I feel it falls under this uh, subtopic of digital diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, you know, like this, this has come up in our UNESCO work, and I think it's appropriate that UNESCO is, you know, education, science, and cultural organization because that's a cultural change. It's a change in our collective behavior and how we approach things. Again, like the way that our grants are designed and things, it's typically competitive. You are pressured to create new things in order to get your, you know, the reward structure is kind of funky. So in order to change that, um, that's why like groups like ESIP are so important because it's sort of saying, yes, you can still get that while contributing your innovation to, to or towards operational systems. You know, there's a pathway for implementation. Um, so I think most of it is just trying to socialize that mes message, practice what we preach, show that it can work. And just like the semantic um, harmonization work for Cryosphere, since we did it this way, it can be picked up and it is being picked up by a number of uh, agencies, organizations, et cetera, around the world because they know they can rely on it. And it had a multilateral group of experts and, and contributors over the years. So I think, you know, we just have to show that it works and uh, inspire similar activities. Of course, write about, write about it. Uh, you know, we've been playing with the paper for a while, but uh, you know, mostly we've been focused on the work. So that's that's a short answer to a complex question. Thank you. Very complex question. I appreciate that, Pierre. Thank you very much to everybody, the presenters today. Very, very good work. Thank you. Yeah, so please, once more, call to engage with us. Um, we're trying our best to engage in this digital diplomacy and make it possible. So I hope you can you know where to find us now and we're we're open to try and help when we can. Yeah, I would say those people who have a little bit more time, there's a link to the three takeaways that ESIP has been using. So we have a little spreadsheet for that. If you have a little extra time, we don't have time to do it now and discuss it, but uh, the link is in the chat and also on our master page. One thing we didn't get a chance to ask and discuss is uh, there was some idea of maybe having a training session 
uh, in a couple of months, maybe on this as a follow up. Um, and if, if you have an interest in that, let us know. Maybe that's one of the takeaways that you would like to have a little bit more hands on type of uh, session.